Did you know that there's two different kinds of well? Yeah. Did you know that there are hundreds of different kinds of water that can come out of a well, depending on what the well is dug in? Did you know that you should always test your water quality coming out of the well and uh, make sure that it's okay for fish, but if you don't want to test it, there's another way to make your well water safe? That's what we're going to cover in this video today. The ins and outs of keeping tropical and pond fish when your source water is a well. Let's get started. So I've been lucky. I have I had a question about a uh, well. What you know, it was basically well, I've got well water, what should I know? It's pretty much what the question was. And I thought that's a good question I can answer because I've lived on wells at least since 1999, we moved up into Blue Ridge, Georgia, and um, everything's a well up there. So, and if somebody told me that my house was on a well where I was going to try to raise fish, I would be genuinely excited because the fir for the first thing, you don't have chlorine in the water, which is healthier for you as well as for the fish. You don't have to use dechlorinator and everything goes a lot better and the water is in that regard is always healthier but not always healthy for fish and there are ways that well water might not be healthy for your fish so notwithstanding that there's no chlorine in the water so you don't have to mess with that so if you're constantly replacing water which is my favorite way of keeping tanks and ponds clean it is by trickling water into it all the time um, there can be issues with where the well is dug if you're coming off a well in Florida, for example. Um, in Florida, there is a tremendous amount of groundwater that comes up out of peat bogs. The water may actually be a very pale yellowish color, and the pH may come out at 5.5 because of where the water's coming up out of. The Florida was underwater for a lot longer than the rest of the country, or at least major parts of the country, and there's a lot of, well, you know, okey finoki swampy stuff and all that buried hundreds and hundreds of feet under the ground where your well is dug into and so the water may be uh, pitifully soft and it may even have ammonia in it uh, from ancient decay processes down there so in Florida that's another one thing and then let's just say that you were in Reno Nevada on a well and I always use them as the uh, um, uh, typical you know the flagship for super hard water um, if you're coming from a well down in, in uh, Reno, Nevada, then you, the water's coming up out of like solid limestone. So the alkalinity is going to be as high as it can read, and the pH coming out is going to be very, very high. And um, so it, that's kind of like the anti Florida. In Georgia, and possibly where you are, the water may come out in the vicinity of neutral with an alkalinity of 30. And if you look out your window on the left side, you'll see the Grand Canyon. I know it sounded like a pilot um, cruising at an altitude of 33,000 feet. And the total alkalinity today is 100. Um, so the, as far as water quality is concerned, it's kind of a nice thing to know. And you can test that. Um, but there's things that go way beyond that. And I'll tell you a couple of those. So there's two different kinds of wells. There's a board well and um, a tile well. The board well basically is where somebody has taken this one of those great big trucks and they put the, the little coring things on it and they dig a hole in the ground that may be six or you know, usually about eight inches, I guess, in diameter. And they bore that straight into the ground until they hit solid water. Not just a little water, but they have to hit where the, the tip of the drill is like right in water, like an uh, aquifer of groundwater, which is awesome. And that could be hundreds of feet. It could be thousands of feet. It varies. Um, but the well is very, very narrow. And that's great. That's a particular kind of well. And it takes a very high pressure pump to push the water up out of because usually those wells are very deep. And that high pressure pump can sometimes create an issue. Uh, which is injection of air into the water uh, because anywhere along the line to the surface there can be a pinhole and under certain circumstances 
It may be that the water coming up under pressure past that pinhole can venturi or suck little tiny amounts of air under pressure into the well water. And, and if that happens, what you'll notice is you use the well water to fill up a tank or whatever, and there's uh, a million little tiny bubbles that appear on the surfaces of everything, the lining the sides of the tank and the plants and even the fish sometimes in extreme circumstances, you just get this light dusting of bubbles all over everything. That's not desirable. It's not fatal, usually, unless it's absurd uh, how bad it is or if maybe the dissolved oxygen or, excuse me, dissolved air level in the water is dangerously high. And I'll tell you later how to know. But uh, back to the board well, it's just a like a core taken out of the earth and uh, a pump is dropped down in there. Now the tiled well has clinical relevance, I'll get to that. The tiled well basically is they drill a biggish hole, maybe 12 to 14 inches or so, and they uh, drop tiles down, which are basically like macaroni noodles. These are, I believe, or at least all the ones I ever had, were older wells, 30 years old. Uh, was the one that we had that was tile. And that was the kind of well that was, it was basically concrete line because they just kept sliding those macaroni noodles down um, to the bottom. I don't guess you get those that are 600 feet deep, but um, well, that's what we had was a tiled well in uh, Madison County out in the middle of nowhere. And um, the, the, the thing about tiled wells, it goes to a story, which I'll tell you right now, children. Um, we had a situation where a client called up and was telling me that they were having chronic ammonia problems and that they had followed all the advice I'd ever given them about, you know, testing the water and trying to use ammonia binders and constant water replacement. And it just seemed like replacing the water made it worse. Well, you know, your brain goes immediately to, well, test your tap water for ammonia. And um, so they did. And the tap water had high levels of ammonia in it. Now, here's where the story diverges, because one of these cases was down in Florida, and they never really knew it. They had just moved in, I suppose, and, and they didn't, or had never tested, and they found out that ammonia was coming out of the tap because they were in Florida and coming off a of peat bog. So it's not like I made that up. It was actually a case that I saw, and that was the trick ending. The other case, which I find more interesting, was uh, those folks um, with a tile well that um, had chronic high ammonia levels, and we searched and searched for reasons uh, for why their groundwater would have ammonia in it. And it turns out that uh, because it was a tiled well, it was possible for an animal to fall down in the tiled well, which is what had happened. The um, uh, opossum, I, I guess, based on remains, when they finally uh, had their well checked out, uh, to see what might be going on. Uh, turned out there was a dead possum floating down at the bottom of their tiled well. Kind of interesting, huh? So having a well matters uh, as far as where your source water is, but the kind of well matters because sometimes junk can get down into your well. Not so much if you have a cover on it, not so much if it's more than just a well house, and uh, not so much if it's a board well where there's no way to get past the tube down into the well, but if there's a tile well big enough for a body to fall down in there, it can. Maybe that's where Jimmy Hoffa is. Who knows? Maybe you have ammonia in your well water. My, uh, little tiny bubbles in your well water, you understand what that's from. Ammonia in your well water, there's different ways that that can be happening. The uh, pH and total, total alkalinity in the water from your well can be uh, changed by where the water comes from, what you drilled into to make your well. Um, Constant water replacement is better with a well. But what happens if there's like poisons or toxins or, I don't know, some other kind of stuff in the well water? How, how, do, you, how do you know that? Like, can you trust well water? If you know what the pH and ammonia and, and nitrite and, you know, you kind of have an idea what the testable features are, how do you know whether or not your well water is good? And there's a thing called uh, biological test, which is by far my favorite method of determining whether or not your well is okay. And the biological test is, for better or worse, um, putting, you know, setting up a system of some sort. Usually it's a great big tub with some kind of bio seeded filtration system is good. And there's, I have a whole video on bio seeding. 
on my YouTube channel and uh, set up a system and put fish in it, just some fish, um, goldfish or whatever it is that you have handy and for fresh water or salt water, whatever you're going to do the biological test on, and you run your biological test for all intents and purposes, let's say that you run your biological test, basically canary in a coal mine testing, one day for $5 worth of fish. Huh. Why, how, what? If you ha Let's say you're getting water, you're doing a biological test for $5 worth of fish in a community tank, and there's no hearts involved for sentimental sentimentality. Um, running a biological test for a day, maybe two, is usually almost always adequate. But let's say you're dealing with $500 worth of fish, and the fish in the tropical fish industry are, are priced on rarity. If it, No matter how beautiful they are, if they're a dime a dozen, they're not going to cost a lot. But if they're rare and have been imported from a closed population of fish in southern Africa, uh, that's going to be very, very expensive based on rarity. I get, I get that. So uh, if you are doing a day of biotesting or uh, biological um, testing, for $5 worth of fish, if you had a $500 worth of fish, you would probably be treating, um, you know, at, at, at least a month or more, um, 100 days, three months. I guess that's what that works out to. Well, here's what I'm getting at, basically. If you were to um, keep a biological test running for a month, at that point, things that were more insidious would show up, like uh, chemicals that were cumulative in the system or let's say you're running uh, high nitrate levels and you didn't know or maybe you know periodically when the well would come on it would pump hydrogen sulfide up in small amounts every time the well came on but not all the time and that hydrogen sulfide might take 30 days to build up and it would be nice to find that out instead of just running a biological test for two days. So if the stakes are higher, run the biological test longer before you trust expensive or rare fish to the well water. So that's a biological test. Really, if, if you want to get right down to it, and this is very trustworthy, there are a thing called uh, land-grant colleges. They're colleges that were established way back when agriculture was the thing in, in America. It wasn't the information age yet. And they were starting colleges to try to get information out there about how to get a better crop. Uh, and land-grant colleges have what's called an extension service. And it, within the extension service, they've got forestry departments and that sort of thing, and, and agricultural departments that have soil test labs. And uh, for example, at University of Georgia, their soil test lab is the, is the part of Georgia that runs water testing. I know, right? Wouldn't you think it would be the water test lab? But anyway, this is the soil test lab in the Department of Forestry at University of Georgia is where they run the uh, water tests. And that's where you'd send a to the extension service. And that's where you'd send your water to have it tested from your well to make sure that, you know, and they, they give you the basic numbers like ammonia, nitrite, and pH, and alkalinity. But they also check for uh, suspended solids, clay, and even some uh, ground level toxins uh, that might leach into the water, uh, pesticides in particular, and certain kinds of herbicides, and dieldrin, and you know, all that other crazy stuff. So sending water to your uh, extension service is a great way to know beyond a shadow of a doubt uh, whether or not there's an issue with the actual water that you're pulling up. But then it, it doesn't change the fact that it's worthy of being cognizant of the kind of well you've got because junk can fall down into a tiled well. And uh, noticing the oxygen or air saturation of the water that's coming up, whether it forms tiny bubbles, and um, a biological test, nevertheless, on, on fish that are of, of a discardable or expendable nature to preserve the lives of fish that are much rarer or harvested from the wild. So that's kind of what I know about well water in 15 minutes, and I'm sorry it ran so long. Um, but, you know, if you're into well water or you're going to use well water, I would close by saying that um, the houses that I've had with well water were where my fish were the healthiest of all time. I could replace water constantly, didn't have to worry about dechlor. Water quality was always the highest, and um, I think well water is the bomb.
And perhaps for some people, maybe in Florida where the wild water's terrible, it's a curse. They actually sometimes have to lagoon their water to improve their well water enough to use it for fish. That's a whole other story. Like and subscribe. I'll say that after every video. Check out the description for any uh, links or resources. Maybe uh, uh, koivet.com slash resources. Maybe I'll start putting together a list of extension services, uh, colleges in the United States where you could send water tests. I don't know. Have a good day.